You know, I think it's a misnomer to say that everything on TV is bad, is evil, has an agenda. Um, in fact, it might be hypocritical for us to sit here and say that because obviously we work in production and we're creating this documentary. So we went back to the beginning to see how media affects the brain, more specifically children's brains. So we took a road trip up to Seattle to interview Dr. Dimitri Kasakis in where he has spent the better half of 15 years researching the developing brain and while it's being influenced by television. The concern I had was that uh, exposing the developing brain to the rapid sequencing of television programs, particularly baby DVDs, which are more rapidly sequenced even than normal television, uh, would precondition the mind to expect high levels of input. And that would lead to shorter attention spans later in life. Reality couldn't, if you will, keep pace with the expectations that had been created by watching too much fast-paced programming later in life. Uh, and we found just that, that the more television that babies watched before the age of three, the more likely they were to have attention problems later in life. Specifically, for each hour that they watched on a typical day uh, before the age of three, their chances of having attentional problems were increased by about 10%. So to put that another way, a baby who watched two hours of TV a day before the age of three would be 20% more likely to have attentional problems at age seven compared to a child who watched none. And we followed that initial study up by looking at what children watch, because as you might imagine, not all shows are paced the same. And if our hypothesis was right, then the more fast-paced programs they watched, the greater their risk would be of having attentional problems. And that's exactly what we found. The more fast-paced programs they watched, the higher their risk. Slow-paced programs, particularly those that took place in real time, didn't appear to increase the risk at all. So, that was part of a series of early studies uh, looking into what I call the overstimulation hypothesis, that you can overstimulate the developing brain. So our work has progressed now to developing a mouse model of this. And if you will, we have what in effect is mouse television and we expose newborn mice to overstimulation. We have them watch television, which is to say we have lights flashing and sound piped into their cage for about six hours a day, starting at 10 days of life through their childhood. And then we test their cognitive uh, and behavioral development. And then what we find is that the overstimulated mice uh, are, have shorter attention spans, are greater risk takers, and have poorer cognitive development than the normally weird mice. Now when we're talking about children and you're exposing, you know, uh, or children are exposed to this, what what age range are we really talking about? I mean, is there, uh, is there a difference between, you know, a five-year-old, six-year-old, or seven-year-old? In 1970, the average age at which children began to watch television regularly was four years of age. And today, it's closer to four months of age. And that rapid shift hasn't occurred so much over the last 40 years as it has over the last 15 years. There were no products that were aimed at children that young prior to about 15 years ago. So the advent of baby DVDs and all of their claims of making children smarter, uh, more musical, more mathematical, have really successfully gotten parents to put their babies in front of the television. And because the babies because babies' brains are very much a work in progress, the effects of baby TV uh, are very different than the effects of preschool television. And if we have a conversation about preschool television, you'll hear me say very, very different things. Because although I'm a firm believer that TV exposure before the age of two should really be minimized, after the age of two, there are programs which, if used appropriately, uh, don't pose any risk to children at all. In fact, have been shown in many studies to proffer benefit. At a TED conference, Dr. Kostakis showed that not every media production that is labeled educational is necessarily beneficial. Which brings us to Baby Einstein. Now, many of you probably have not seen Baby Einstein, but I will show you a random 20-second clip from Baby Einstein Day on the Farm, and, and here it is. Uh, in that 20-second clip, there were seven scene changes, about one every three seconds. It's about the most exhausting day on the farm since John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> 
And of course, it's nothing like being on a real farm, right? Adults watching this find it discombobulating because your mind is trying to make a coherent narrative out of this, and there is no coherent narrative. It jumps all over the place. But babies aren't trying to make a coherent narrative out of it. They're not capable of doing that. It's all of that screen change, all of that stimulation that's keeping them actually engaged in the screen. So we've had for a while what we call the overstimulation hypothesis, which is that prolonged exposure to this rapid image change during this critical window of brain development would precondition the mind to expect high levels of input, and that would lead to inattention in later life. So you watch enough Baby Einstein day on the farm as a baby, and when you go to a farm as a school-aged child, it's boring. It's too slow. How come there's no sheep suddenly popping into my face? How come there's no marionette going back and forth? Why do I have to walk from here to there? That's the general idea that you're conditioning the mind to that reality, which doesn't actually exist. Is there a danger to exposing the mind to realities that don't really exist? If you just observe a small child at play, you'll notice that they're very active in their play. They're very animated. When you take that same child and you place them in front of the television, that activity stops. The same thing takes place in the mind. Parts of the mind simply stop. Watching television is a passive activity. You're not interacting with what you're seeing. A child's mind, to develop properly, needs to interact with the world around them, needs to interact with people, especially. When you're born, you're born with billions of brain cells and trillions of connections can be made. By the age of three, you have twice as many synapses as you do as an adult. I mean, think about it. Kids are constantly learning. They're interacting with their environment, and this is what's needed for proper brain development. The pathways haven't been formed yet. And as these pathways formed, as the child interacts with the world around them, interacts with the people around them, each time a neuron fires, there's a protein sheath that's laid down over the axon of the neuron. The myelinating of the neurons in the mind strengthens those neurons and strengthens those pathways. Between the ages of six and seven, there's an enzyme that's released into the brain that dissolves all poorly myelinated pathways. So any neuron that hasn't been used or hasn't been formed into a pathway and doesn't have a thick myelin sheath, it's dissolved, it's pruned, as it were. When you place children in front of television, there's no interaction, there's no real life movement or, or, or anything with what they're actually seeing. This, this situation has caused the American Pediatrics Association to recommend that children under the age of the two should never be exposed to television. France has even taken it a bit further and said any child under the age of three should not be exposed to television and has made it illegal to produce programming geared towards that age group. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. I hope you guys liked that clip. It came from a documentary called Pseudology. If you want to purchase this documentary, you can get it from littlelightstudios.tv. We've got some more clips from this documentary. You guys can check them out over here. You can also rent it on Vimeo. If you want to subscribe to our channel, hit that little subscription button and you'll be notified when new videos come out. And also, if you want to help support our work, Patreon's a great way to do that. You can help us continue to put videos like this out. We hope to see you guys soon. See ya.